All right, back here on Inside Wrestling Radio, got Norton Lewis in the house this week, and he's telling us a little bit about his history, and uh, we're going to pick up from there, and we're going to move forward into uh, NCW, but we'll get to that a little bit later in the interview. Uh, Norton, uh, you were talking about world class, and uh, and what happened after uh, after your world class time there? What, Charlie, seriously, with the microphone, done, you're killing us over here. Put some oil on that thing or something. You need some WD-40 or what? Yeah, yeah. All right. So anyway, back back to the uh, back to the interview here. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, you now. You said you did some international travel there. Tell us about that. Yeah, Bill White's a very good friend of mine. Him and him and Ox Baker, and they uh, well, went through uh, Mula. I'm sure everybody knows who Mula is. And I got the opportunity to go to Japan a few times and did uh, did some shows down in Mexico, uh, which was uh, which was definitely interesting because it was a lot different style than what I'd been used to. Sure. Uh, one of the fun, one of the most fun parts, though, I mean, was traveling to Puerto Rico with Bill. Uh, you know, I, I was down there and and doing a lot of shows, and I was getting over pretty big as a heel. And I, you know, we were coming to one of the uh, outdoor stadiums one day, and I saw these kids with a wheelbarrow with rock, and they had my name painted on them. So I was like, Hey, man, I must be really getting over. You yeah, know, right. people love me. And Bill said, No, they hate you. That's the reason your name's on them rocks because these kids will pay fifty cent a piece. Get one of them rocks, try to hit you upside the head with it. <laughs> so they would throw the rocks at yeah, you. Yeah, they throw the rocks at you. you know? <laughs> I'm like, wow, boy, these people really love me here. Back up just a little bit and talk a little bit more to us about Japan. How was that? Oh, uh, that's a. I'll be honest with you. In Japan, it was just like being an NFL football player or something. Sure. When you got there, they rolled out the red carpet. I right. mean, they. It didn't matter who you were. They didn't have to know you. They didn't. Nothing mattered. You were a, an American wrestler, and they treated you like a king. I mean, the, the best hotels, I mean, everything they could give you, they gave you. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when you when you left there, you left with, bounce with your pocket full of money and, and, it, and felt good about the time that you were there. Absolutely. And how much time did you spend in Japan? Uh, I would go over for like six weeks at a time. Bill and uh, Bill took me twice and Mula took me once over there. And it's like I said, it, it was a great time. It was real enjoyable. Uh, the the biggest thing was was the language barrier. Sure. Uh, because some some of the guys could not speak any English, and you know the only thing I and I don't I, I just barely knew how to order a beer in Japanese. <laughs> well, that's important to know. And that's real important for <laughs> you, me. You got anyway. to know. That should be a class on that just before you get there. <laughs> exactly. What kind of houses were you working in front of over there? They I mean they would have some small places that you'd go in would be you know three and four thousand, and then they'd have some venues where they'd have thirty and forty thousand people. In. Unbelievable. I mean, it's, 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 you never knew from day to day where you were going to be. Yeah, and that's a thrill walking out in front of uh, that kind of people, you know. Who, it, you it, get it used really to the smaller is. houses in America, and then you go over there, and it's like, wow. <laughs> it really is. I mean, and, you know, at that time, you know, I had I had been working, the you know, a lot of spots with the uh, Mid-Atlantic. And, you know, the biggest thing to me was the, the first time I ever got to work at the old auditorium in Greenville yeah. was a huge thing. And sure. I worked Bill White on that show. Sure. You know, and here we are in front of 6,000 people, and, you know, and that was great to me because my first show, I think, was in front of like 65 people. Right. You know, and then I'm here at the auditorium in front of 6,000 people, sold out because Ric Flair is happened to main, you know, be in the main event that night. Right. And then to go a place and see, you know, 30, 40,000 people, it's just unbelievable, you know. I'm sure it's People just, would show up. Yeah, I'm sure it's just a shock. And, and the crowd reaction, Brody was in a few weeks ago in an interview, and he was telling us about his time in Japan, and then the, the crowds are just like night and day over there because they, they, they don't uh, respond to us. They, they don't. The way that they do in America. Uh, you know, it's, it's more like being in front of a golf crowd more than anything. Sure. That's kind of the way I looked at it. Uh, they, you, you get a response every so often from a certain move or something, but as far as – as uh, as you being able to heal them and them respond back to you, no, that wasn't going to happen. Yeah, and that's that's got because we're trained to, to in America to work the crowd, work the crowd, work yeah. the crowd. You know, and and there that's kind of out the window. It's more what you can do in the ring and and how you can get over your storyline there in the ring, and, as opposed to bringing the fans into it like we do in America. Exactly, they're there just to, like like if they went and watched a movie. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly like, how they are. It's it's, it's just a, a an, an odd. Uh, a, a, reaction there let's move forward just a little bit because we're, we're really short on time here Let, let's talk about ncw and how'd you come into uh, to ownership and, and operating there of ncw up in greenville well roughly about a year ago uh, donovan cruz uh, came to me that he was he'd been running it for about a year and he just wasn't able to spend the time running it that he that he wanted to he was looking for somebody to buy it that he knew would care about the business and wouldn't just shut it down you know or give up real easily so he approached me about it uh we worked out a deal for me to buy ncw from him and at the time see i wasn't wrestling very much because a lot of people don't know this, but four years ago I had a heart attack, mm-hmm. and so I had pretty much stepped out of the ring for a while. Right. Uh, but through the different contacts that I had, I made arrangements for you know people like Brody Chase and Michael Judas and a lot of other guys to come back and, and let's really get the ball rolling here. And then started bringing in some of your your names like Ricky Morton and Ivan Koloff, you know the Barberry and a lot of guys that are old friends of mine. And we and we begin to see the houses turn around and, and really make a difference there in Greenville. Plus the local talent. I mean, and anybody knows me knows that I am I, I handpick people. Sure. If you work 
work at NCW, there's a reason for it. Absolutely. And I handpick the talent that I want on the show because I want the best, the best locally to be on that show. And we saw the crowds going from 30, 40, 50 people to, you know, one night I drew close to 600 people. Unbelievable. And averaging a little over 200. You know, and I heard somebody mm-hmm. say that the night I had Paul London there, that I had less than 100 people. Right, yeah. Well, that gentleman was very misinformed because I had 208 people there uh-huh. the same night that they had a race going on at, uh, you know, two miles up the road. Sure. And, uh, you know, so sometimes you need to be informed about what to say before you open your mouth. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll pass that along to the, uh, the to the proper individual. Okay. I think he'll be back next week, as a matter of fact. But uh, but I'm glad you're doing good up there. And I, I hear nothing but good things. And I, I really need to get up there with the way that uh, my, my, my real life gig goes. It's, it's hard to, to move around a lot. But I'd really love to get up there and, and check you guys out. Now, tell us this, from the promoter side of it, how is it dealing with some of the egos and attitudes that come along with, with the uh, thought of, well, I'm a star now and I can write my own ticket? How do you deal with that? Well, you know, you got guys that come in with that attitude. Most anybody that, that has ever been in a locker room that, that's on a show of mine knows that there's one thing that I, I don't put up with, and that's attitude. Yeah. Uh, you can check your ego at the door, or either I'll check it for you. You know, because you're here in the same locker room with all the other guys. You're no better than they are. Yeah. You will respect everybody on this show, or you will find your walking papers. Absolutely. You and know. I don't really have a problem with it, to be honest with you, because not too many people want to come up to me face-to-face and come across with an attitude. Yeah, and but the thing about it is, and we, we've talked about this uh, in, during the break, the, the Internet. And, and these guys get on the Internet and just say whatever they want to say, and they don't realize that there are repercussions. Now, back in the day, if you had a problem with a man, you'd go up to his face and say, look, I don't like the way you did this. I don't like this is happening. And and you'd either fight it out, work it out, or walk away from each other. And that's exactly. the way. It, well, that's the way it used to be. But now with all this, um, you know, internet stuff, and and the guy can smile up in your face and then leave and get on his computer and, and stab you right in the back. You know, I, that's to me that that's kind of a punk maneuver. I don't like it. I'm not a part of it. You know, if, if you my friend, you my friend. If I don't like you, I don't like you. And I'm going to be straightforward with you and tell you how I feel. And, you know, you guys, I'm loyal to you and Brody, and y'all are my friends. And, and if I see something I don't like, by God, I'm going to let you know about it. And and, and how you handle it is, is, you know, that's that's up to you. But, you know, I just I just think that if you got a problem with a man, you need to go to the man and tell him. And I agree with you totally, uh, Regal, because, yeah, I have had a few situations like that, and, and I addressed it as soon as it came to me. And, and, I, and I you know, I'm not going to bring up any names or anything because I'm not about throwing people's names out because then I'm just as bad as they are. Absolutely. But, you know, I've had a few guys that I've had to talk to about those things, and I'll be honest with you, a couple of them were really professional about it. They apologized, said, you know, you're right, we were wrong, we shouldn't have done this, and, uh, you know, the problem wasn't with you or NCW, it was with, uh, you know, another individual. Right. And we kind of got on a tangent about it and everything, and we apologized because we're we're trying to be professionals and we do respect you. And I'm going to tell you what, I got all the respect in the world for people like that. Yeah. It's those that want to get on their uh, keyboard and become superheroes. Yeah. Yeah, but yet, when they, like you said, when they see me, you know, I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread. Absolutely. You know, yeah. and they just can't wait and they want to beg me and find out, well, how can I get on your show? You yeah. know, you know, well, first thing is, is get out behind your kit, your monitor and get off that keyboard. <laughs> exactly. You know? Yeah. Uh, buy some boots and actually go and get somebody professional to train you. Sure. And, you know, quit doing it in your backyard. Yeah, and, and backyard is, is also another scourge on our business. And those guys just think they can come in and because they see something on TV, they think they can do it. Norton, we are super short on time, man. We're going to go to another break here. We're going to hold you over until the last segment of the show. we got about seven more minutes after this break. And uh, and we'll talk some more with you. And we'll get your websites out there. We'll plug your big upcoming shows and, and whatever else you want to talk about. And we'll be right back. More Inside Wrestling Radio with Norton Lewis right after the break. 